broken because of our union with Christ. We died with him and rose with him, and now we are free to serve him. It's easier, again, easier said than done, right? Because Paul also told us of a very real struggle that we have, each of us as believers, between our flesh, which are those sinful desires that we still have by nature, and the spirit, that new law or principle or desire that he has worked in our hearts when he caused us to be born again. Now, Paul described his own experience in Romans chapter 7. How he delighted in the law of God. That's what he wanted to do. But still found himself doing the very things that he hates. And we know that this made him cry out, O wretched man that I am. Who will set me free from the body of this death? You see, Paul's sins really troubled him. He wanted to put those things off because he wanted to be like Jesus. And of course, that's what the Spirit of God does. So what was the answer to that question? Well, the answer, of course, was Jesus. He's the answer to everything. But more specifically, the Spirit that Jesus has given us through His work. Now, we know that He's already given us the Holy Spirit. Paul told us about that. Um, that's why the struggle begins. Because instead of just one desire that we had, which was for sin, now we have two. Now we want to do what's right, and that's what creates the struggle. But what Paul is telling us in Romans chapter 8 is that the Spirit gives us more. He gives us the ability to overcome our sins if we will appropriate His help. See, the problem is it doesn't just happen automatically. It'd be wonderful if it did. I'm a Christian now, I'm perfect, you know, and I'm going to do perfectly everything at all times, make the right choices, but, but that doesn't happen. We know that doesn't happen, and that's what Paul was struggling with. So how do we overcome this? How do we grow? Now, as I've said um, before, because this is such an important topic, I thought we should dwell on it a bit more before we continue in Romans this morning. In chapter 8, Paul is, is really describing for us several different things that the Spirit of God does, several different things that He gives us. In the passage that uh, we looked at last week, He gives us the power to obey. He also gives us the assurance that we're a part of God's family, and I think through giving us the power to obey as well as giving us the ability to be able to call God our Father and to know that it's true. We're going to see this morning at towards the end that he gives us the hope of the glory that's ahead of us, this expectation uh, of this wonderful situation that's ahead that will make all the suffering that we have to endure really um, not, not even worthy uh, to be compared. He says that he also intercedes um, to, you know, to God on our behalf. Uh, we're going to look at that uh, next week. And how through these various ministries of the Holy Spirit that God is working everything together in our lives for good. Again, that will be next week. Now, all of these things come as a package. You can't have just one without having all the others, right? So knowing that these things are ours really begins with the first one, which is knowing we have the Holy Spirit who gives us the power to obey, to fight against our sins, gives us, first of all, the desire to fight against them, but also gives us victory over our sins. As Christians, we don't have to live in sin. We don't have to be the victims of sin. We've been set free. It's no longer our, our master. We're no longer its slave, but now we are the slaves of Christ. So let's expand on what we saw last week a bit before moving forward, and that is how the Spirit gives us power to overcome our flesh. Now again, Paul tells us, in order to do this, we must walk according to the Spirit. And apparently in his day, that was all he needed to say for the Romans to understand. Uh, maybe they could have used Sinclair Ferguson's exposition. We're going to borrow from that a little bit later. Um, it would have been helpful to have all of the Scripture. But uh, Paul believed that that was sufficient, maybe because they had the Old Testament Scriptures and they could learn from the Old Testament what this means because it's nothing new. It's what God's people have always had to do in order to overcome their sins. Now remember the word walk refers to how we conduct ourselves in the world, how we live. 
And the phrase according to the Spirit means that we are to live in a way that corresponds to, that imitates, that emulates the Spirit, what He wants, what He loves, what He desires. Now, what does that look like? Okay, well, it looks like Jesus, right? Because Jesus was anointed with the Spirit of God above measure. And that is what, you know, there, there's a lot of different theories of, as far as how that affects him. But we might say at least this, that Jesus as a man had a perfect desire to serve and honor the Lord in obeying his commandments because the Spirit of God filled his heart and his mind. Okay, you want to know what it looks like to walk according to the Spirit? Jesus did it perfectly. Now remember that God has predestined us to be conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that doesn't mean that we're going to be like the devil until the day we leave this world and then when we enter into heaven, suddenly we're going to become like Christ. What it means is that the Lord has ordained that he is going to work Christ's image in us while we are in this world. And the way that he does it is through the Holy Spirit. Remember, Jesus calls him the paraclete. That means the helper. Jesus was going to go away, and so Jesus told his disciples, I'm going to send you another helper who will be with you, who will do for you what I have done for you. And, of course, what did Jesus do for his disciples? Well, he counseled them, he encouraged them, he helped them, he corrected them, he helped them to live for God's glory. Well, that's what the Spirit of God has been sent to help us do, to learn God's will, to... to to be able to live according to his will. And of course, he's called the Holy Spirit, not only because that is his nature, the Holy Spirit is holy, but also because he is the author of holiness. It is his particular work in, in the plan of redemption to work holiness in God's people, or in other words, to make his people like Jesus, like the example, like the paradigm. God is holy. And if we would live with him forever in heaven, we must be holy. And as the Puritans often reminded us, if, if, you know, if we read the Puritans, they were very interested in holiness because they knew that holiness had to begin on earth if we were ever to enter into God's holy heaven. So to make us holy, he gives us the Spirit. And the Spirit is the one who creates this desire for holiness within us. But as we've already seen, this is really what it is that creates the tension that we're experiencing, the struggle between wanting to do good and wanting to do things that are sinful. So the question is, how can we become more like Christ if we still have to wrestle with this sin, this old man, this flesh that keeps getting in our way? Well, this is where I would like to refer to Sinclair Ferguson because I know we all remember perfectly what Ferguson said in that series on who is the Holy Spirit, but I thought I would remind us anyway um, because, you know, it can be helpful from time to time. But he shows us how the Spirit of God helps us. So first of all, the Spirit creates in us a sense that we must put our sins to death. They have to go. Paul writes in Romans 6, 2, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? Okay, we are new creatures. We are alive from the dead. We died with Christ on the cross to sin, to our old way of living. The old man is dead. And now we were raised only to serve Christ. For us, sin is no longer an option. Sin must be put to death. Secondly, he reminds us the Spirit of God has broken the power of sin in our hearts. And we've, we've already seen that, haven't we? Sin will no longer be master over you because you're not under the law, but you're under grace. And what that means is sin no longer has a monopoly. We now have a choice. We can choose not to sin. We can choose to do what's right. Now, sadly, we can still choose to sin. But we have the power to choose not to sin. We have the power to choose to do what is right. We can do it. You've heard that expression, just, just say yes or just say no or whatever the thing is, right? Well, what, in the secular realm, what they're saying, just say no to drugs, well, you know what, a lot of people don't have the power to do that. 
And when we tell somebody, just say no to sin, well, most people don't have the power to do that. But we do, you see, by the Holy Spirit, because we have a desire to do what is right. Now, thirdly, the Spirit of God reminds us that we are responsible to do this. We have a direct command from the Lord to do this. Paul writes in Philippians 2, verse 12, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Have you ever wondered what that means? Work out your salvation? I mean, didn't Jesus do it all? Didn't he obey and give to us a perfect righteousness, take away our sins, work out your salvation? What does that mean? Well, it means that we are commanded to put off our sins and to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul just simply says it in different ways in different places, but it all means the same thing. This is our responsibility to do these things. Now, Dr. Ferguson went on to tell us the Spirit also gives us motives, motives to do this. First of all, he helps us look beyond the here and now, the things that we're experiencing now to eternity to remind us of what really matters, what's really important. Think about the decision you have to make, the moral decision, okay? Think about it here, but think about it a thousand years from now when you're in heaven, looking back. If you could do that, what would you, what would you, uh, what, what would you have wanted to do? You see, a thousand years from now as you're looking back. That's the decision you should make now in the light of eternity. What should I do? The Spirit of God reminds us that that matters. Uh, The Spirit of God points us to the cross to remind us if we sin, what those sins cost the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, let's not forget that our crimes, our sins are the reason why he suffered and died. So every sin we commit is a reason why Jesus went to the cross. Do we really want to make the wrong choice, the sinful choice in light of that? Sadly, we often do. The Spirit of God reminds us that because we are in union with the Lord Jesus Christ, that means that we're involving Him in everything we do that's wrong because our members, our bodies are His. Okay? Listen to what Paul writes in to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 6.15 with regard to the idea of a Christian visiting with a prostitute. He says, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Which means that our bodies belong to him. Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Basically, I'm using what belongs to Christ to dishonor him. By, by doing something like that, well, we should think about that. When we choose to do something against what the Spirit of God is telling us is the right thing to do, what we know is the good thing to do, we're involving Christ in those things. And then, of course, he reminds us, and this is perhaps, I shouldn't say the most sobering, but it's very sobering. He reminds us of what will happen if we do God's will or if we don't do God's will, and that's what Paul talked about in Romans 8.13. If you are living according to the flesh, which means if your general way of living is giving into the flesh and going that direction, you must die. Now, I don't think he's talking there about physical death. I think he's talking about eternal death. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Sanctification, again, is inseparable from justification. If we have been saved by the grace of Christ, we will be conforming to his image. There will be a struggle, but there will be victory in this struggle. Now, this, what I've just described, what Ferguson just described, is what we should experience really every time we are about to make a morally significant choice. Okay, we have a, there's always going to be a choice between what is right and what is wrong. Now, not every choice is morally significant. Should I have a banana or should I have an apple? Well, if neither of them are going to be detrimental to your health. You can have either. It doesn't matter. But, you know, should I help this person or not help this person? Should I lie or not lie? Should I covet? Should I lust? I mean, you know, obviously we know the answer to those questions. But whenever anything of moral significance comes up, The Spirit of God is going to bring all of these things into our minds. So I thought what I would do is maybe consider a specific example. 
in something that I think we can all relate to, and really I could pick any of the commandments and we should all be able to relate to those, but I thought I would pick one that's a little bit more socially acceptable, but it shouldn't be, coveting. Coveting is something we all experience. We see something that we want. Maybe something that someone else has, it's one of a kind, unique. I want that, you know. Something that is out of reach financially. I, I'd really love to have that car. I'd really love to have that house, but I can't afford it. But how can I get it? Or maybe we want something that we really shouldn't want, shouldn't have, because it's just plain wrong. Now, the first thing the Spirit's going to do is to remind us that that is wrong. Okay? The Lord says, you shall not covet. By the way, how do you know that coveting is wrong? Because the commandment says you shall not covet, right? We have a nice handy summary of what is right and wrong in the Ten Commandments. The Spirit of God is going to be reminding us of the Ten Commandments and what they say. So the law says you shall not covet, and since we have died to sin, we need to die to that desire. Now, secondly, he's going to remind us that we have a choice. Okay? We don't have to covet. We don't have to give in. We can be content with what the Lord has already given to us. If what we want belongs to someone else and it happens to be unique, one of a kind, we can thank God that he has blessed them with that thing. Be happy for our neighbor, right? Love our neighbors, we love ourselves. That's really a part of that commandment. Third, he'll remind us that we're responsible to make the right choice, that this is a part of working out our salvation with fear and trembling, putting off the old man and putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, and then he will give to us reasons why we should let it go, why we must let it go. He'll show us what really matters in the light of eternity. Does it really matter whether I have that thing, that car, that house, that bubble cum baseball card that is worth a million dollars? You know, is it really gonna matter a thousand years from now? What is it going to cost Jesus if I can't let it go? If I continue to covet and sin and desire that thing, that's more sin that's nailed Jesus to the cross. I, in light of what it cost him, we, we need to avoid sin. Um, that if we pursue this thing, we're involving Jesus in this, right? He, we're, he, he's a partner in this because we're taking his body and we're using it for whatever it is that we're doing that is wrong. And then that most sobering thing, if we can't let it go, we may very well end up losing our souls, right? It's, it's been said by the Puritans, and I think they're right. They're the ones, you know, who give you both guns, but they do it with grace. And they, they, they give you all of the love and grace of God with both guns, and they give you all of these, you know, these, these other negative consequences also. But they say something like this, if there is any one sin that has dominion over you, then you're not a Christian. Okay, that's, that's pretty strong, isn't it? He didn't just break the dominion of some sin. He broke the dominion of sin. We have a choice. And so if we can't break free from it, then that tells us something about our state spiritually. We, we don't have the Spirit of God. Now, I'm not saying if we don't struggle with it, because we're all going to struggle. And not that we're going to fail many, many times. We are. Okay, but we should be able to overcome it and do the right thing. And then finally, we'll see the wisdom of doing the right thing. He's given us the desire. He's shown us why it's good and right. We see it. We understand it. And then we'll let it, we'll let it go. Now, again, we may fail many times. We may go through a cycle many, many times. But the Spirit will eventually free us. The fact that we're still struggling against it is a very good sign. Because if we weren't born again, if we didn't have the Spirit of God, we wouldn't have the struggle. We'd just simply do it, except for what conscience may cost us and, you know, reputation and those types of things. If somebody found out what would happen, those are not virtuous reasons. But if we're struggling with these things because we really want to honor the Lord, because we really love Him, that is a very good sign. Now, again, this is how the Spirit of God's going to work in all of our choices to help us keep all of God's commandments because that's exactly what Jesus did. Did Jesus keep just eight of the Ten Commandments or just nine of the Ten Commandments? 
No, he kept 10 of the 10, and he kept everything else besides. He did everything perfectly, every application. In his mind, in his heart, in his words, in his actions, he did everything perfectly. That's what the Spirit of God is working in us, which is why we need to be led by the Spirit. We need to walk according to the Spirit. As Paul says in, in Galatians as well, walk by the Spirit because that, that is the Spirit's work. Now, last week we also saw that the Spirit gives us assurance that we are a part of God's family. Now, what we've just looked at is one of the main ways that the Spirit of God does this. Notice verse 14. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Okay? If we're walking according to the Spirit, if we're following Him, if we're imitating Him, if by His strength we're putting to death the deeds of the flesh, putting to death our sins, then we can know that we are His children. That is the Spirit's testimony to us, one of them, one of the ways He shows us. But there was another way he, that we saw that He did this, and that was by giving us the sense that we belong to God. Since we dealt with that last week, I'm just going to touch on it. The confidence that when we pray, our Father that it's really true. Paul calls this the spirit of adoption. Our Heavenly Father wants us to know that He is our Father and that we are His sons and His daughters. So again, that was all by way of review, and I wanted to bring that second point in because it's, it's important we see one of the ways that we know that we belong to God is that by the Spirit, we're walking by the Spirit, and we're putting our sins to death. But now let's move on to the third blessing the Spirit gives us, and this is where we're pushing into new ground, and, and the point will not be a long point. The hope of the glory that's ahead of us. Paul says if we know that we are his children by the way we live, by the, the filial spirit that he's given to us that gives us this confidence to call God our Father, then we can also know that we are heirs, his heirs, joint heirs with Christ, of his eternal and glorious kingdom. Now, we should note first the condition of this blessing, okay, which also must be true of us if we are to inherit it, and this is not new. Verse 17, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Okay, now he's not really saying anything differently here than what he has already said. If we are led by the Spirit and become more like Jesus, then we will suffer as Jesus suffered. That's really a mark of sonship, isn't it? That we suffer for the sake of righteousness. Jesus says in Matthew 10, 25, if they have called the head of the house Beelzebul, which is a name for the devil, that unclean spirit, Lord of the flies, so to speak, how much more will they malign the members of his household? You know, if, if we belong to the household of God and the eldest son who is over the house is hated and maligned by the world, then we are as, we're going to be as well. Okay. Now, we can expect this depending on our eschatology. <laughs> At least until the kingdom fills the earth, or perhaps, as others might say, the kingdom's still going to fill the earth, but we can still expect this. Okay, as long as there are people around who hate God, they're going to hate us because we are becoming like Him in a moral sense, not, you know, not in an uh, ontological sense. We don't become gods, but we do become like Him in character. Now, Paul asked the question, should we be concerned about this suffering? Well, Paul says, I'm not. <laughs> he actually gloried in it. And he tells us that we should not either. And here again is where the eternal perspective that the Spirit of God gives us can be very helpful. Because look at what this suffering is doing. It's creating for us an eternal weight of glory that has no comparison to whatever suffering. And Paul touches on that here in verse 18. He says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. He's saying that what's ahead is so much better that it's going to eclipse anything that we will have to endure on earth. As a matter of fact, they'll just wipe the memory of that entirely away. We know that's what the new heavens and the new earth are going to be like. Now, again, what is this glory? Paul is looking ahead to the ultimate glory that will come when Jesus Christ 
comes to bring the new heavens and the new earth. Now, he reminds us that the present creation is under a curse. By the way, it's the same curse that we're under, the same curse our bodies are under. It's subject to futility, to emptiness, to uselessness. The Bible tells us that in some sense, sin has returned the world to its formless and void condition, the one that it was in in the world, you know, at the beginning, when the Spirit of God was hovering over the creation and the earth was formless and void. Jeremiah tells us that in some sense, sin has returned it to that same condition. I looked at the world and behold, it was formless and void. Okay. Now, God made Adam and Eve rulers over the creation, but when they fell, it was cursed along with them. And we might ask the question, why? Well, think about it, you know? I mean, the rulers of creation are cursed. They can no longer rule over a perfect world that is blessed because that world that, that existed in the days of Adam and Eve before the fall was a world in which God dwells. Remember, he was on the holy mountain in the garden and he walked on a regular basis and had fellowship with Adam and Eve. That's the situation. That was the world that was then, that beautiful creation. Well, when Adam and Eve fell, the world cannot continue like that. That's why there's a heaven now and, and an earth and why at the end they're going to come together again. But Paul reminds us that it's not going to be that way forever. See, that's the work of Christ reverses all of this. We noted in our study on eschatology that when Jesus returns in his second coming, he is going to free the creation from this curse, from its corruption. He's going to bring about the cosmic renovation the new heavens and the new earth, and Paul reminds us that that is going to be glorious, okay? It's going to be back to the way it was before, or maybe even better. But is that really what he's pointing to, that's going to be so much better to be a part of this perfect world? It's, you know, at least you know, what I see and what I experience is, is perfect. I mean, we think a fallen world is beautiful. That, that world's going to be really beautiful. No, I think he's talking about the more that's going to be there. Okay, what is it that's not going to be there? There's not going to be any sin, no suffering, no death. And what's going to be there? Perfect love and joy and peace because God and the Lamb dwell there. They are the temple. They are the light of the world. It's going to be filled with their glory and we're going to be bathed in that and in that love. And in that view of a perfect beauty that it, it's hard to conceive. I mean, we, we love things because they're beautiful. You know, whatever, whatever that might be, we, you know, we are attracted to beauty. But the Bible tells us that God's beauty is infinite. It, we only just get a glimpse of it through the gospel, through the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the down payment of the Holy Spirit that gives us a glimpse of that beauty that makes us want more and makes us pursue heaven until we finally arrive there. But you see, heaven is right now is, is a place of much greater glory and we, we want to be there. Paul says to depart and be with Christ is very much better than anything down here. But think about how much more glorious the new heavens and the new earth are going to be when everything is perfected and they are there in all that glory. It's going to be wonderful. Paul tells us it's going to wipe out all the suffering that we would have to endure or you know, to serve him now. Now, Paul tells us that the creation itself is longing, it's groaning, it's suffering the pains of childbirth until now as it's eagerly waiting for this transformation to take place. Now, I do think Paul is using personification here. I don't think he's saying that the creation is a sentient being that thinks and has affections. And yet, in, there's some sense in which it's yearning and inclining, it, it, it desires this. I, I can't tell you exactly what that means. Is he talking about the earthquakes and the tornadoes and these are the sufferings? Of, yeah, I don't know. But he is saying that it has a desire for this. And so do we, okay? So do we. So our suffering is worth it, first of all, because it assures us that we're going to inherit this glorious new world, but it's worth it, secondly, because when that day comes, our bodies are also going to be set free from the curse. Right now, our bodies are still under the curse along with this world. 
they have been redeemed in principle, but we're still experiencing the effects of the curse. I mean, just look around, look in a mirror. (laughs) You know, all of us are growing older, right? We're growing older, we're growing weaker, more frail. We experience sickness. We're eventually going to die. Why does that happen? It's because our bodies are under the curse still. So they're redeemed in principle, but they're not yet fully redeemed. But yet on that day, they will be fully redeemed. Paul says in Romans 8, verse 23, And not only this, But also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. Now the Spirit is reminding us that not only one day we'll be a part of this wonderful, you know, eternal kingdom, this glorified new heavens and the new earth, and receive that full inheritance, but we're also going to receive new glorified bodies that are perfectly fitted to enjoy that new heavens and that new earth forever. And he's saying the Spirit of God convinces us that that's true. And that makes anything that we have to suffer for the kingdom of heaven worth it. Now, this is the hope the Spirit of God has given to us. He says, you know, nobody hopes for what we see. We don't see it yet. And because we don't see it, we hope for it. We eagerly wait for it, not because we're hoping we're going to get it and we're not sure, but because the Spirit of God convinces us it will be ours, and that is our hope, and we embrace that in the same way that Abraham embraced the promises that were still way off. He never actually saw the fulfillment of the land promise, but he knew it was his, and he had the hope that his children would have it. And so we have that hope also of heaven. Now, next time, we're going to see that the Spirit of God works in us further to ensure, to convince us that there is nothing in heaven or earth that will ever take that hope away from us. And in the meantime, we have the hope that everything we have to endure in this world, that He is working together for good, working together to prepare us for that glorious new heavens and that new earth that will come in the future. Well, let's bow, shall we, for a moment of prayer, and let's, um, let's thank the Lord for these mercies, and let's also pray. Let's not forget what we saw at the very beginning. Let's pray that, this, that God would help us to use the resources He's given us to fight against our sins, to put on the Lord Jesus Christ so that we do suffer, knowing that those sufferings are worth it.